Okay, so welcome everybody to our next webinar, Peatland Hydrology and Carbon Cycling in a Changing World. So today we are joined by Joseph Holden, Chair of Physical Geography at the University of Leeds. He's been the Research Dean for the Faculty of Environment and he is also Director of Water at Leeds, one of the largest interdisciplinary university-based water research centres in the world. So today Joseph will examine recent research on peatlands which investigate the major threats that peatlands face globally. He will introduce the processes which enable us to better predict impacts of peatland degradation or restoration and prioritise locations for investment to rehabilitate or conserve peatlands. So thank you all for logging in and Joseph, I will now hand over to you. Well, thanks so much, Rihanna. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, joining you today. Peatlands cover around 3% of the uh, world's um, surface. Um, uh, this is a map we produced a couple of years ago, which just was an amalgam of all different sort of peat, map, peat maps around the world, kind of latest information. So you can see their distribution. And we think that they're really, really important, much more important than the land coverage for uh, global biogeochemical cycling and the carbon and hydrological cycles. So I'm going to kind of cover those sorts of topics in today's presentation. Peatlands um, range or sort of exist in a number of different areas. So as you saw from that map, you find them in tropical regions um, and we're under-reporting probably the number of tropical peatlands. These are some photographs taken by one of my PhD students, Santoza Sandi Putra, who's working in Indonesia uh, on tropical forested peat systems, but also systems that have been drained and some that have been restored. And in these areas, the peatlands form very flat terrain but then they sort of form a sort of gentle dome shape as the peak grows over time. And the dome might be actually 20 kilometers wide and the center of the dome might only be a few meters taller than the edge. So very gentle gradient uh, peatland systems, but rich in biodiversity. In other areas, we might have permafrost peatlands, for example, where the peat can form very slowly during the summer through plant growth. And then it's so cold and damp that the peat doesn't the plants don't decay, so you get slow accumulation of peat in the high latitude regions. And then you might also get peatlands in valley bottoms, for example, which form there's an accumulation of water at the foot of hill slopes. Uh, and this water logging is then conducive to, to peat development. So most of these peatlands form a very flat areas. But that's not always the case. And so here's an example of a peatland where you've got the peat is kind of blanketing itself across the rolling terrain and this happens to be in northern England in the Pennines and so quite unusually there is a type of peat called blanket peat because of this blanketing property which forms across uh, sloping landscapes. Now the problem here of course is if that peat gets damaged in some way the vegetation might get removed for some reason that actually because of a slope it means that it can quickly erode and degrade and lots of that peat can just be washed off the landscape and down uh, into river systems. Uh, I don't know if anybody watching this could recognize where this photograph might have been taken of. But you can see it's a wonderful pool system within, within the peatland terrain but actually this, this is in northern Scotland in the flow country where there are blanket peatlands across both flat areas and the hill slope areas. But you can see in the top Right of the, of the photograph, this is an incursion of coniferous forests. So we've planted conifer trees uh, across these amazing peatlands. And in retrospect, this may not have been such a good idea uh, from a carbon perspective and from a kind of ecosystem function perspective. We had to drain these peatlands to plant the trees. And then when the trees have grown, they've caused further drying of the peat. And that's not such a good thing for peat, because when peat dries out, the carbon that's been stored within the, within the peat mass itself gets lost. So I'll talk a bit about that uh, slightly later on. So peatlands are really important. And over the past you know, 10,000 years or so since deglaciation, there's been quite a lot of peat growth in cold, wet, high latitudes. But actually, there's a lot of peat that's been established for longer than that in the tropics. And we still don't really have a good handle on the rate at which peat has grown in the tropics and how much carbon is really stored there. What we know in general terms is that if you take a bit of peat and you take the water out of it, of what's left, half of it is carbon. And 
if you think about that peat map, which I showed at the beginning, which said, well, about 2.83% of the world's land surface was covered by peatlands. Actually, peatlands still hold more than half of all the world's soil carbon. So when we're thinking about protecting soils to protect carbon, well, actually we need to protect peatlands to, to keep that carbon locked into the landscape. Half the world's soil carbon is stored in peatlands. And around a third of all carbon that's stored in the terrestrial biosphere. So that's all the living stuff, all the forests, everything that's there. A third of all the carbon is in peatlands. So they're really, really important from a kind of global perspective. They're also important for kind of storing fresh water, but I'll talk a bit later on about how that doesn't necessarily translate to providing water for, for direct use by humans. Now, most media coverage when we hear about, about climate change or carbon actually talks about industrial pollution, energy use, you know, use of cars, heating of buildings and so on. But given what I've just said, management of landscapes could be really important too. So, the recent kind of UK climate change committee and government announcements around protecting peatlands and the need to kind of protect and restore peatlands is really very welcome. If you think about in Scotland, for example, 80% of all soil carbon in Scotland is stored in peatlands. It's about 60% for the parts of the UK. So management of landscapes could play a really critical role in enabling us to achieve net zero. The challenge that we face is that degraded peatlands are currently responsible for around 5% of global anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. And the photograph that's currently on screen is a shot of a peat extraction site near Manchester. And we're using peat to power power stations in some countries, to use in horticulture, so you can buy peat in garden centres, for example, as compost. Uh, and we're extracting and using this all the time. And this is, this is one of the issues that we've got degraded peat and we're taking peat out of the landscape. And yet this has been a really important carbon store in the long term. Uh, and we're releasing this, this carbon back to the atmosphere through peatland degradation. So there's a big challenge there that we need to tackle. So what is this peat stuff? Well, it's actually just simply dead plant material, right? It's formed, you know, the plants grow, they sequester carbon in their, uh, through photosynthesis in their growth. But then because these environments are wet, they, the plants don't decay, fully decay when they die. And so the kind of growth of new plants happens at a faster rate than the decay of dead plants happens. And so you get as residue left behind. The organic material sort of just builds up in a deposit and accumulates year upon year. And this varies from location to location. So it depends whether you're in the tropics or in a cold region or, or the particular context you're in. But often the accumulation rates are quoted as about a millimeter per year. So it takes thousands of years to build up a good depth of peat, but it does mean that in some places you can find 20 meter deep peat deposits, for example. Now, when we walk across some of these blanket peat landscapes that we see in the uplands of the British Isles, we often see the water just running straight across the surface of the peat. So we see it dripping down from the side of faces of, of the peat and so on. And uh, that's actually really important. What it's telling us is that, yeah, the system's wet. It's kind of full of water. And as we can see from this kind of bottom diagram, which shows a water table profile over a one year period for a peatland, for blanket peatland. And we've got kind of zero marked here where I'm kind of moving the mouse, you can sort of see the sort of water levels sort of oscillating around zero. So we've actually got some ponding above zero. So we've got a saturated environment and only for short periods during the summer do we get a kind of draw down of that water table, maybe to 30 centimetres deep. So it's hard, hardly any depth at all when you think about it. What this means is that when it rains, there's nowhere inside the peat for the rainwater to be stored because it's already, the peat is already full of water. So all the spaces, the pore spaces, are full of water. So the net result of that is what kind of happens in the top graph, which shows for the same year, the discharge in a river coming out of one of these peat systems. So this, this discharge then is very rapidly responding to the water table or to the rainfall. So basically, as soon as it rains, you get a really quick rise in the water level in the stream. And then as soon as it stops raining, it falls back down again. And during dry periods, maybe just a couple of weeks without rain, the river levels fall to very, very low levels, almost close to zero. So this is a very flashy 
river flow response. It's because the peat is holding lots of water within it. But what it also suggests is that even during the summer, really, most of the water just sort of sits there in the peat. It doesn't just kind of drain out and empty out of the peat to keep river flows maintained. It sort of sits there. So that's because the peat is really not very permeable. So it's good at holding water, but its permeability is very small. And we see this when we've had a measure how much water moves through different depths of the peat. And we've measured this, we find about 80% of the, the water moving through the peat is actually happening right at the surface. Maybe the next few centimeters down is most of the rest, but most of the depth of the peat, and that could be several meters deep, you've hardly got any water movement through it at all. And when you kind of dig through the peat profile, here's, you know, we've, we've kind of dig a little hole here, brought some peat out. You can see how the top layer is just this dead plant material and just sort of grades down from the living moss and some other things, some sedges and so on in here. And it's grades down, you can see the kind of dead mosses and it's grades down into the kind of more darker peat below it. However, the problem here is that when we look at lots of UK peatland systems and, and many other places around the world, this upper layer is gone. We've degraded the peat so that there isn't this kind of dense and deep kind of living to dead vegetation mat. And instead, the peat surface is often something like this, a firmer, um, less permeable surface. And what that means is that when we get flow running across or through the peat of the surface, instead of it being slowed down by this dense mat of vegetation, it can actually move more quickly across a surface which might be more like the, the darker peat you can see in the photograph. So that might be a challenge then in terms of degradation leading to perhaps enhanced flood risk downstream. And that's a, a challenge we need to tackle. Now that's kind of okay for temperate and high latitude peatlands, but tropical peatlands, the story's a little bit different. And these are just recent discoveries. We don't know too much about tropical peatlands really. But some work by Andy Baird at the University of Leeds and, and colleagues has shown that the permeability of tropical peatlands is about a million times faster than the sort of peatlands we might get in the temperate or high latitude region. And so what that means, if you, if you dig, some, dig some ditches into a tropical peatland, drain it for agriculture or something, water will very, very quickly flow out of that peat into the drains if the water level in drains is low. And then you've, you've basically got lots of opportunity for that peat to degrade because as soon as you move the water you can oxidize the peat it will be released as carbon dioxide but in addition to that because it's warm in these tropical areas the peat degradation rate will be fast and so you can rapidly lose peat and lose carbon as soon as you degrade the system through drainage and because the permeability is high so the water will flow out quickly from the peat that's less true in the temperate and high latitude peatland so these, these are not all the same as what I'm saying. Now, the carbon budget of peatlands, it's actually, despite what this diagram may suggest, is actually rather simple. And the way to think about it is really that you've just got input of carbon dioxide from plant growth or through photosynthesis. You might get some respiration through plant, from plants as well, from microbial action in the peat. Um, but basically, there should be a net gain of carbon, allowing the peat to grow year on year. Might be some other losses which might be removed in stream water by erosion or by leaching of dissolved carbon which makes the water turn brown and that can be washed off just as it rains and the, and the, and the water flows out of the peat. And then the other kind of critical part of the process is methane. So peatlands release methane into the atmosphere because of this anaerobic environment, this kind of waterlogged oxygen depleted environment is conducive to methane production and they can bubble up, that's ebullition, bubble up through the peat and be released, or it might be released through plant, of plant stems and so on. But the methane can be turned to carbon dioxide on that journey. And often things like sphagnum moss, which can grow at the surface of peat, can actually have microbes that turn the methane into carbon dioxide. But methane is important because it's about 23 times more powerful than CO2 as a greenhouse gas enforcer. So we need to understand how that's controlled. But the critical controls on the carbon budget of peatlands is water table position, so how wet is it, the temperature, so that controls plant growth and microbial decomposition, and the plant communities themselves are there, they will control the carbon budget. And humans, of course, can control all three of those in different ways. Now, I mentioned this dissolved organic carbon, this leaching of water that can come out from peat systems, this turns the water brown. And this creates a big challenge for water companies, and in the UK, Many water companies have headwaters 
supplying their reservoirs, which have got a lot of peat within the headwaters. And when you treat this dissolved organic carbon rich water with basically chlorinated products to kind of treat the water, this releases toxins, which are strictly regulated and cost quite a lot of money to remove. So this is a big challenge for water companies. Now, dissolved organic carbon concentrations have been increasing over the past few decades. And some of our recent work, particularly by Jiren Zhu, who's one, who's one of my PhD students now who works at the University of Glasgow, he has shown using some climate scenarios how for different ri major river catchments in the UK that supply drinking water from peatlands, how actually the trend is increasing and going to increase to 2100. We're going to see, for example, much higher dissolved organic carbon concentrations in river waters through lots of, uh, through lots of these catchments by 2100. And this is compounded by the fact that most of the increases are going to happen in autumn and winter, which is already the period where we get peak dissolved organic carbon concentrations in water supplies. And our treatment works were built, many of them in the 1970s and 1980s, when DOC concentrations were lower. So this is a big challenge because they're already at capacity in many areas. If we want to build a new water treatment works for one, one sort of river network, this can often be 50 million pounds of investment and capital. So these are big costly challenges that we need to tackle. And if we can do something about it through land management at a much cheaper investment rate and build other benefits as well, then that could be a really useful thing to do. So how much water does come from drink, uh, does, how much drinking water does come from peatlands globally? It's an interesting question. And what we did there was first of all say, well, where is the peat and where are the people and where do they overlap? And this was an idea that Jiren came up with, which was the kind of peat, pop, peat people index or peat population index, the PPI. And so we kind of produced this hotspot map of where people and peat interact. And then we could look at, well, where, where do the people in those areas get their water supplies from? Is it really from peat or is it from other areas? And we find that actually 85% of the global total of people being directly supplied by water from peatlands is actually consumed in the UK and Ireland. So the British Isles are this major, major hotspot, really unique globally, for the fact that we rely on a large amount of our water supply coming from peatlands. So this means we actually need to be thinking about protecting and managing peatlands for other reasons, and particularly for drinking water reasons in the British Isles. But there are some other hotspot locations too, as you can sort of see from these maps. Now, there are several threats to peatlands. I'm gonna go through a few of these at the minute. So for example, we've got the extraction problem that I mentioned earlier, using peat for horticulture and for fuel. We've got problems related to historic industrial pollution, which has killed off lots of the surface mosses that were sensitive to that pollution. And so what that's led to then is once you remove those surface mosses, you can get kind of water flow over the surface of the peat, which then starts to erode the sediment, remove more vegetation, and away it goes. And you can rapidly get degradation. So you can have these kind of bare peat areas, or you can have deep gullies that form, and all of that carbon has just been washed out of the system. And it turns out it doesn't really last very long in the stream. It doesn't kind of you know, go and get locked into the oceans or something. It actually can be turned over from streams quite quickly and released and degassed from the streams back into the atmosphere. Plus, of course, you've got no photosynthesis happening because there's no vegetation on a bare peat area, and so you get a double whammy. And then the third part of it is that this erosion, mean, because you've got no vegetation, means that water can flow more quickly across the peat surface and through gully systems and so on out into rivers. So you might get bigger flood peaks. And we've shown this by measuring how fast does water move across bare peat surfaces and across surfaces which might be well vegetated, say with sphagnum moss, for example. We find that it actually occurs at about 10 times a faster rate. And we've measured this in the field at different water depths and different slope angles, and we find the story still holds true. So if you've got a bare peat surface, water's moving 10 times quicker than if you've got a really nice moss cover on that peat. So then what we've done is we've kind of said, well, what does that mean in terms of the flood hydrograph? So let's just pretend our catchment is entirely bare pretend our catchment was covered with sphagnum and then put some rain into our model and see what did that do. And you can see here in purple, you get this kind of, this is what the, how the flood peak would look if the catchment was entirely bare peat. And how the flood peak would look is in green if it was covered with, with all this dense moss cover. And so that gives us an envelope of possibilities by which we can think about, let's make sure the peat doesn't degrade to this level, but let's also think about restoration 
what flood benefit will it give us? Well, this is kind of a maximum opportunity. So that in between the two is a kind of where things will lie through restoration work. Drainage is another threat. I've already mentioned that the threat in terms of the tropical system is in very, very rapid decay. But in temperate and high altitude peatlands, drainage won't lead to the same process. But instead, what will happen is that the drains will just redirect water into stream systems. So you can see on this aerial imagery some kind of lines, which are the drains that have been dug in here. Instead of water kind of flowing down the hill slope and keeping the bottom of the hill slope wet, what happens is the water just flows, meets the first drain, flows along the drain, and then out into the stream. And that means that previously where the hill slope would have received water at the bottom of the slope from upslope, it no longer will. So it's not wet anymore. So the peat degrades through a different process than the tropical process, simply because water supply is kind of cut off from upslope by the intersection of drains. This leads to kind of desiccation of the peat, oxidation of the peat, shrinkage of the peat and cracking and so on. And you even get kind of large cracks appearing and large uh, pores appearing like a Swiss cheese effect. So you can get underground erosion in the form of pipes. So these are kind of holes or channels in the peat in which water and carbon is being released. And we find about 15% of all carbon releases coming out of these pipe systems when we've measured them in these peat systems. And some of them are large, these pipes large enough you can crawl, in, crawl into. And in Derbyshire, they used to call these sludge caves because cavers used to kind of go and go into the peat and crawl in and, and do that sort of thing. When the, when the pipes get so big, they'll, they'll collapse and they'll form gullies. And then you get even faster loss of carbon. And what we've found through survey work is that when we've compared the age of ditches that have been dug into peat with the density of soil pipes, there's a linear relationship. So as the ditches get older and older, you get more and more soil pipes appearing. So because of this kind of drying out of the peat on the edges and then cracking and desiccation and shrinkage, the pipes can form and then they can grow and grow over time and enlarge over time. So there's questions then about whether we should actually go and block some of these pipes up that have formed as part of peat restoration. And one of my PhD students, Taco, is currently uh, looking at exactly this sort of issue right now. Burning, another threat to peatlands in South America and in Asia and in the British Isles we seem to be preoccupied with the idea that we should be burning vegetation on peat to manage it. And the grouse moor economy supports this sort of activity, which results in a sort of mosaic, a patchwork of, of, of landscape in which there are different ages of burn patches across it. And we can see how radically the vegetation has changed in these peat systems because of this patch, rotational patch burning, roughly since about the 1870s. So when you take a core through the peat, it's preserved the kind of history of plants and so on that have been in that peat system. You can see how the often in many calls we've taken that from about the 1870s onwards, there's a dramatic change in the vegetation cover because of this sort of burn management that we've adopted in these upland catchments. Now, the result on the in terms of processes is that actually you can get more compressed upper layer of peat, so the density is greater. And you also get, this means it's harder for mosses to re-establish because of that increased density. And that means that when you do get overland flow during the biggest rainfall events, this means that actually you can move much more quickly across the, the peak surface. And so you get higher stream flow peaks as a result. So again, there are some kind of knock-on effects of this sort of management on the environmental system that we need to consider. Plantation forestry, I've already mentioned in terms of the kind of UK context, but it's happening in many other peatlands around the world. And in Indonesia and Malaysia, there's been a huge drive around palm oil plantation, which has led to a large amount of drainage and lots of burning and destruction of, of peatlands. And so Indonesia, for example, is now the third largest emitter of CO2 behind China and the USA. 85% of Indonesia's greenhouse gas emissions are because of this sort of land use activity. So there's a huge drive now in Indonesia to kind of put a stop to this and think about investing in restoration of peatlands. So here's one of these kind of plantation forests in Indonesia. You can see how we've transformed the natural forest into this drain system. Each of these blocks has got drains all around it. And each of these blocks, you can see the individual oil palm trees in the plantation. So we're changing one of these kind of natural domed peat systems through the drainage uh, into the palm oil plantation through this, this mechanism. Now, we're doing pretty much the same thing in the UK context. So this is just an aerial imagery, some aerial imagery from part of East Anglia. 
these are peat. This is a peatland. And each of these fields has got drains around them. You can see the ditches here. And we control the water levels very tightly so that we can have very productive arable crops on this landscape. And off, this, is, this is all sorts of crops on here, lettuces, salad, leaf, you know, carrots, everything you can think, celery, all these sorts of things are grown in these landscapes. And we control the water level through ditch agreements and through drainage boards and so on very precisely to ensure good productive landscapes. And these are economically very important food production areas. But because we're lowering the water table, and that you can see to quite deep levels, often a metre, a metre and a half depth, we're also causing oxidation of that peat every year. So each year, the peat disappears. And in some of these kind of farmlands, there might only be 50 years of peat left. So this is really important to understand, understand that we're actually uh, accelerating carbon release through this kind of land management practice. And we need to think about whether there's anything alternative we can do in these landscapes to kind of reduce that emission. So the point here is that agricultural peatlands in the UK are the UK's largest land use carbon source. So we really need to get a handle on this if we're gonna achieve net zero, uh, the net zero agenda. And, and as I said, the critical thing is the water table. So here's some data that we produced when we kind of surveyed lots of lowland peatlands in the UK. And this is work led by Chris Evans, and it's published in a report to DEFRA. And what it shows is that there's different elements here, but if you look at the net carbon dioxide balance versus mean water table, what it shows is that if we have a deep water table, you know, 60 a metre depth, you've got high carbon dioxide release from the peatland. But as you come down to maybe 15 centimetres depth, then you have a net gain. So as you kind of wet the peat up, you get a net gain of CO2. Methane, it's a different story. So for methane, you get hardly any methane release at all when the water table is deep. But when the water table comes shallow, you get a higher methane increase. So this means we don't kind of want lots and lots of ponding of water on the peat because you get lots of methane release. Now, how does this all work out when you balance it off? Well, if you get a water table of about 10 centimetres deep or less, then the carbon uptake, when it's negative, means you're getting net carbon uptake into the peatland. That's great. So that's where we need to be. And in terms of a greenhouse gas forcing, well, something about 10 centimetres again is the kind of minimum greenhouse gas forcing from peatlands. So what we're saying is that the methane story is important, but it's not the overriding factor. And if you can get water table to around 10 centimetres depth or less, then this is a fantastic thing you can do to try and enhance carbon sequestration and reduce losses. How do we achieve that? That's, that's a challenge. Wildfire, permafrost melting, climate change is really important. This is actually a shot of Mars the Moor wildfire a year or two ago from satellite imagery. It's not plain, it's a satellite imagery. You can see the flames and there are serious concerns about climate change and wildfire in peatlands. But of course, fires like this actually tend to be humans uh, setting fire to the system through either accidental or deliberate mechanisms when we're in these UK settings. But certainly lightning and other uh, sources of fire in more remote settings can become uh, more problematic with climate change. And with permafrost melt, there's a bit of a challenge there around understanding what will happen. In some cases, there might be increased peat formation through more longer growing seasons, for example, and, and faster growth rates of plants. But in other cases, the, the collapse of the peat, the, the permafrost might mean the peat system itself collapses. And that's some of the work led by Graham Swindles that we've done in the Arctic, where we've been looking at kind of what happens to these peat systems. We think that some of them will just kind of collapse with melting, and with that kind of shrinkage and cracking and drying that will occur. And they will just oxidize and release that carbon back to the atmosphere before getting to a new state whereby new form of peatland can grow again. So actually there's going to be a lag time where we'll just have release a lot of carbon before it's kind of in the situation where we can kind of grow new peat and gain more carbon again. So there's an interesting sort of cycle to be gone through there. And then finally, there's also a threat around infrastructure that we're putting into peatlands. So wind farms seem to be really good in terms of our net zero agenda, are often being put into windy places, which are often remote and often peaty. And so you get tracks and turbines installed, and these all interfere with the, the peat ecosystem, changing its hydrology, but also removing some of the peat footprint. So there's no plants on these tracks, for example, that's sequestering carbon. So there's some challenges for how we do this in a, in a more sensitive way. One of my PhD students, uh, Jess, she's looking at even how we remove tracks and different types of tracks to minimise the impact on the peak system.
And here's a, an old terminal in Shetland where what they've done is they've scraped away the peat for the terminal and they've put it into these big containers. These are concrete containers about 15 to 20 meters tall. They've just scraped all the peat away, put it into these containers. And the idea is then when this site is decommissioned in, I don't know, 20, 30 years time, they'll put all the peat back again. I'm not entirely sure how successful that will be. And I'm not sure anybody's measuring how much carbon is being released from these containers. But that's uh, an interesting concept anyway that they came up with at this site. So are peatlands currently net sinks or sources of carbon globally? Well, uh, overall, peatlands are still net sinks. And that's because the PPI is low for most peatlands, i.e. there's not many people where most peat occurs. But as I said earlier, uh, we're still managing through all of these different threats to degrade our peatlands. And they're responsible for about 5% of global anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Yet, peatlands offer the potential for future action against climate change because they take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into the landscape. So, anything we can do to protect currently undamaged peatlands, restore damaged ones where we can, even create new ones, this has all got to be good for the global environment. And this means we can have a quick win, you know, we can reduce current losses, and that's really, really important. Through a restoration phase, you often get, as one of my colleagues at the University of Durham, Fred Worrell, he talks about this, you get quick sudden gains during the, the restoration phase. And then you also get long-term gains through carbon accumulation. That build actually much longer term than tree planting will give you. Tree planting kind of reaches equilibrium after maybe about 100 years, whereas peat just keeps forming over thousands of years. Plus, we might get other gains too in terms of water quality, flood reduction, biodiversity, and so on. So this is what we're seeing right now in terms of the current agenda. So here's a bund that's been placed around peatland right next to that peat extraction site I showed you right at the very, very beginning. This is Chat Moss where they've they tried to protect a former peat extraction site and restore it and keep water on the site through bunding it. So it's kind of flat terrains. So they kind of try to hold water in through putting a bund around the whole system. And then we've got now, instead of spending money in creating drains, we're now spending lots of money on blocking these drains back up again and creating pools as we do so. And the pools actually recolonize really quickly with creatures that represent pretty well what happens in natural pool systems. So that's kind of really good news. So we can quickly increase biodiversity through this sort of activity. What's less good news is that when we've compared natural pools to the pools created through that sort of blocking of drains, we found that the artificial pools still have higher dissolved organic carbon concentrations than the natural pools do. And this is this is showing you for sampling lots of pools through through a period of 18 months or so, that almost throughout the whole year, the artificial pools have more of this DOC in it. So there's a legacy effect of the of the former damage to the peatland, which has still been felt even several years. I mean, I think this was six or seven years after restoration when we were looking at what was going on in these pools. So it might take many years, more years, many decades maybe for the whole system to start to recover. But there are still improvements in these systems. And you see these things across the landscape. So instead of seeing the lines, we get lines now with where all these pools are. We've got tools that can help inform where best investment might go into these systems. And some of them are very, very simple indeed. And it's just looking at, well, where's the topography? And then you can kind of map, well, here's in green one of these drains. And you kind of show everything in red is kind of drier than it otherwise would be if the drain wasn't there. So water previously would just kind of flow down the hill slope like this and keep all of it wet, whereas now it hits one of these drains and runs into the stream. So all this is drier than it would be. So just producing a simple map like this based on topography can be a useful guide for practitioners to say, well, where should we invest our money? If we've got a limited amount of money in the biggest benefit for, for wetting up most of the peat. And it might be in this instance that doing some of these hill slope drains here might be more important than, for example, this dense drainage network down here. So that could be useful. There are other modeling tools as well that are much more sophisticated than this that have been developed to kind of help inform best practice or best locations for restoration activities. When we looked at, is, is restoration working in terms of restoring the hydrology? We find that it's kind of, but not 100%, so it's not fully getting there. So here's an example where right next to each other, there was some intact peat, some drained peat, and some uh, restored peat. And this is just a plot showing for each month during an 18 month period, 
the water table variability. So, so it's actually just how much of the water table moving up and down through the month. So this is what's called the interquartile range, just a measure of variability. And what we see in the intact peak state on the top left of the screen is that you get hardly any variability in winter and most variability in summer. So it's actually just driven by summer evapotranspiration. And during the winter period, there's hardly any water table variability. So the water's just sitting there in the peak. In the drain system, which is directly below that, we find it doesn't matter whether it's winter or summer, the water table variability is the same all year. So the drainage is having an effect on the water table that overrides the evapotranspiration effect. So it doesn't matter what time of year it is, the water table is going up and down every time it rains and then it recedes again because water is kind of lost from the system to the drainage network. And then here's the restored system. It kind of looks halfway between the first two. So we've kind of got some recovery of this dominance of evapotranspiration in the summer and then less drainage in the winter, but actually it's still quite mixed, still quite variable. So the functioning of the peat, even several years after ditch blocking, hasn't recovered. So it slowly gets there, but it, take, it seems to take maybe many, many decades before we'll get there. We have to think long term. And then similarly in the tropics, Santos, my PhD student, he's been working in Indonesia, looking at exactly the same sort of story around in the dry season and in the wet season, what's happening to water tables. So this is just a diagram showing how much time the water table spent at different depths. And, and what we find before we've got natural forest, we've got a restored site and then drain site that we've been looking at. We find that the res restoration does indeed increase the water tables. So it's not quite as deep in the dry season as it is in the drain site. And it's a bit shallower in the wet season, but the restoration doesn't quite give us kind of the natural picture we see. It doesn't quite get there in terms of keeping the water from the wet season on the site all through the dry season. So the buffering isn't quite as strong as it could be. So we need to think about not just blocking drains, but perhaps other techniques we might adopt, like bunding, for example, and other techniques in these systems. And then we've got big challenges where we've had highly disruptive land management, like forest to bog, forest uh, afforestation. So these forest to bog initiatives where we're trying to, trying to remove the trees and trying to re-wet the surface can be really challenging. You see how much disturbance there is here. And so one of my students, Tim Housen, he's been studying the hydrology and the water chemistry in these systems after restoration. If we just look at this example on phosphorus here, this is the typical kind of phosphorus concentration in the intact peatland, so never been afforested. Here's the afforested one in orange. And then here's one of the restoration sites, so it's gone down. But another restoration site is still really high phosphorus. And it just turns out that that one is where we've had left the brash in place. So different management strategies, you know, do we take all of the, the debris away? Do we leave it in place? Can have implications on the water chemistry as well as on the hydrology and so on. And where we've got lots of gullying, we're looking at, and particularly with a project called Protect NFM, which is led by the University of Manchester, looking at whether we can create leaky pools, which allow water to flow out through pipes or letter boxes and so on, so that when we get a storm event, they fill up, but then they slowly release that water at a more regulated rate to perhaps provide flood benefits downstream. And we find that actually that does have uh, an, an important and uh, significant impact. But actually, there's a more broader impact, which is just getting vegetation cover on the peat. So when it's bare, we really need to get that restored. Here, they're just covering the, the bare peat with vegetation to stop more erosion. And then they're trying to promote peat forming vegetation to go on top of that to grow in the longer term, along with re-wetting. I'm going to wrap up now. What we're going to achieve is we're going to achieve really dense sphagnum cover on these peat surfaces. So we model this and we show when we get sphagnum cover and when we spread it around on gentle slopes and on stream channels, this really does help reduce the flood peak, and we can measure in exactly where this should go for the most cost-effective benefit. And so we measure these things and we say, well, actually, in the upper colder, if we were vegetate peatlands, we will reduce the flood peaks in these systems by significant amounts. And what we need to do in conclusion then is we need to be wetting our peatlands through multiple methods, we vegetate them to stop erosion, to encourage peat formation. And in northern peatlands, that means kind of specialist mosses. We can even farm. Uh, for specialist mosses and spread those mosses in other places to encourage sphagnum to spread. And sphagnum palming is possible. And Richard Lindsay, for example, is doing that in the UK. In China, they've been doing it on former ri rice paddy fields. And pollution is now reduced in many places that means sphagnum can still survive.
In lowland peatlands, Indonesia, for example, are investing $2.1 billion in peatland restoration. In the UK, I've mentioned the challenges. We're perhaps not going far enough with our targets around uh, trying to deliver 50% upland and 25% lowland peat restoration because peatlands are so crucial to the delivery of net zero. And of course, we can all do our bit. Don't go and buy peat-based compost uh, would be one starting point. Thank you very much.